take that time to read. It sounds like she got a, a spot on the Zoom group, right? How many do you, oh, I see her there. Hi, Joan. Is the, um, what's the capacity? 100 apparently, okay. and then Facebook is unlimited. Well, so they're just listening to us now. I think they're going to be tens of thousands, John. <laughs> we have and about 100 people coming in on Zoom, John, and uh, we'll have folks joining us on Facebook Live now, too, um, letting them all in as we join. And uh, Jean and John probably know them all. <laughs> no. no, but I reckon okay. there are a few, certainly a few. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, we'll continue to allow folks in on the Zoom, and uh, we welcome you all as well as our viewers on Facebook Live tonight. Um, if you aren't already muted, um, on the Zoom, we ask that you would mute yourself, please. Mute, okay, we're supposed to be muted, except for John. Okay. John. Well, good evening, everyone. Again, welcome. I am Diane Dahoney. I'm the Community Service Librarian at the Paul Sawyer Public Library. And on this eve of Holocaust Remembrance Day, we're delighted to join with Together Frankfurt uh, to partner in hosting an evening with John Rosenberg, who is one of Kentucky's best known and loved champions for social justice and also a Holocaust survivor. There you are. We've asked Ernie Lewis, a member of Together Frankfurt, to introduce John tonight. Ernie retired from state government after serving as Kentucky's public advocate, heading up the Department of Public Advo Advocacy for 12 years, but he got his start in poverty law when he served as John Rosenberg's law clerk in Whitesburg in the early 70s. If you have questions tonight, um, whether on uh, Zoom or on Facebook, uh, please put them in the chat and we will ask those uh, questions of John at the end of the presentation. So now uh, I will turn it over to Ernie Lewis. Welcome, um, I want to thank um, uh, Paul Sawyer Library and, and Diane Dahoney for uh, putting this together and uh, together Frankfurt as well for sponsoring this forum on the eve of Holocaust Remembrance Day. I have the pleasure of introducing a Holocaust survivor and one of my personal heroes, John Rosenberg who has his good wife, uh, Jean Rosenberg, uh, with him, uh, who's been with him every step of the way once he arrived in Kentucky in the late 60s. I moved to Kentucky in 1976, and I wanted to be a poverty lawyer, but I really had no idea what that meant. Um, so I moved to Prestonsburg to be John's law clerk in the summer of 1976. And he, as he drove me around Eastern Kentucky, uh, taught me how to be a poverty lawyer and put that, that uh, fire in my belly that's, that's never gone away. He's done that not only with me, but hundreds, literally hundreds and hundreds of lawyers uh, who are now all over Kentucky and other, and other places. Um, he, uh, there will, I don't want to take any more time. I could talk for, for a full hour about John and Jean. I want to remind you there will be time for questions because I know you're going to have a lot. Please put your, just type your questions into the chat room uh, and uh, we will, uh, John estimates we'll have 20 to 30 minutes for questions. Um, we intend to go until eight, but I've also said to John, we can go over a little bit if y'all aren't dying to get to Hemingway on PBS. So uh, um, it's, it's uh, good to have you. And now it's my pleasure to introduce John Rosenberg. Thank you, Ernie, for, for that gracious introduction. It has been a few years, but then there are many heroes uh, watching. I know there are many folks here who are 
in this group and probably on Facebook who have spent as much of their lives as we have uh, working for social and racial justice. And that's why it's wonderful to be in your company. Um, and I just am um, so glad that Jean is here with me. Many of you know her and I won't spend a lot of time introducing her. I'm glad she's with me. Her latest project, which I'll just mention, and you can call her if you want information. Is that for many, for the last five years, she's been visiting prisoners at our uh, maximum security facility here in Martin County uh, with a group called Prisoner Visitation Support. They visit, they, they uh, visit inmates who request visitors and they're looking for more volunteers. So um, right now, because of COVID for the last year, uh, they can't visit, but, but uh, the Bureau of Prisons is allowing them to correspond. And I will only say that the letters that she's receiving and, and from inmates are so compassionate and uh, really wonderful to read. They're more concerned about our own welfare than their own, it seems. But uh, that's been a, a really uh, great, uh, great thing for me to re read those letters. So uh, I'm really honored to be able to talk to you as a Holocaust survivor this evening. And uh, I thought it, a good way to at least to start would be just to mention a few resources that I would otherwise forget about. The first one I brought with me, some of you know this, Arvin Donahue wrote this, wrote a book back a few years back. She interviewed a series of Holocaust survivors in Kentucky. Arvin now is on a farm in central Kentucky, although she also has a house in Lexington and is a oral history buff and is an interviewer. And uh, the name of this book is This Is Home Now. Uh, you'll probably recognize it fellow on the cover. The uh, photographs are by Rebecca Gale Howell, who I'm sure many of you know has become a very distinguished poet and teaches at the University of Kentucky. Uh, married a few years ago and we were there. So I want you to know about the book. It's on Amazon, or if you want to drop us a line, we'll think uh, it's 30, I think, on Amazon. And if you send us 25, then the entire amount goes to Apple Red. We have a few extras that we keep. Uh, then I wanted to let you know, those of you who have, are not, don't, aren't aware that there's a, a wonderful, really new ho Holocaust center in Cincinnati uh, called the Holocaust and Humanity Center. It's in the train station. It's a very uh, impressive, much larger, it was at a, a private uh, academy, Jewish academy in the outskirts of Cincinnati if, until the last, I think, three or four years ago. But it is worth your visiting, and I wanted you to be aware of that. I also wanted you to know that, uh, as I get started, that Kentucky, we, I'm proud to say, is one of only 15 states in the United States now that requires Holocaust education. And our statute actually says Holocaust or genocide education, but uh, we joined four, 14 other states in two years ago, maybe three years ago. And uh, I don't know how well that's going on. Gene and I went to Hazard a, a couple of years back for a teacher training. And obviously there are a lot of materials online, but it's, uh, I've spoken to quite a few school groups. Students are very interested. And it all depends on, I'm sure you know, I the interest of the teacher. I went to Letcher County many times there before that statute because a particular teacher was very interested. So what I wanna do this evening is to basically take you through a, maybe a shortened version of the, uh, of the talk that I give to students in the schools. We have usually a little more time to do that. So I think Diane's gonna put the, wants me, let me see if I can put the slideshow back the way Ernie told me to do it. I'm not, not very good at this uh, she was gonna do that. technology. You wanna do it, Diane? Um, or do I need I'm not, to? No, I don't think it'll let me do it. If you hit from beginning, 
at the upper left hand side of your screen. You see that right there? Yeah, there you go. Well, let's go That's back. It. Now let's go back. Do these go back? Don't you do it on the keyboard? If you hit your back arrow. Oh, the back arrow. Okay, right, and then go up and hit from beginning again. Hit it again, okay. Okay. There um, we go. So let me, then I, when I get to the next slide, you can tell me what to do or I'll let you go ahead. This is a, a very rough map that uh, gives you the highlight and the family locations. So you, the countries are obvious. Um, we'll begin this town of Lair, L-W-E-R, is my father's hometown. It's a, it's a uh, seaport on very near the Dutch border. So uh, two of his sisters married butchers named Vanderwijk and de Vries, uh, having lived in that area. So that's Lair here. Down, <clears throat> In the Rhine Valley, in a little town off the Naha River, is Idar Oberstein, which is where my mother is from and where my dad went to teach. This is Frankfurt, uh, which I will mention. I had a cousin living there and spent time with the family when my father was in the concentration camp. And this is the city of Magdeburg, where I was born. Magdeburg is about 60 miles from Berlin. Uh, it was an industrial center of about 300,000 people during the war with a vibrant Jewish community. So let me go to the next slide. If uh, Diane, you wanna do it or shall I do it? Okay. <clears throat> so this is a photograph of my uh, grandfather and cousins. Actually, this is my, so there he is. That's my grandfather, Meyer. My grandmother holding my dad, who was born in 1901, says that I think that the uh, description is a little off, but anyway, one of the reasons I want to show this is just the extent of the two families. These, there's the Rosenberg family on my father's side and the Wexler family on mother's side. It's a very religious family. My grandmother had her father and grandfather were rabbis in Germany. And there were, as you can tell, quite a few cousins. When I do this in Eastern Kentucky, I remind students that in this area, there are some very common names going back to Scotland and Ireland. You have names like Tackett and Hall and Stubbo. And uh, today, if you go to the cemetery in Lear, Friesland, you'll find many, many graves many, many Rosenbergs and many, many Wexlers. And so it's worth remembering that these, the generation of all these folks was, were really eliminated by the Holocaust. These, most of these uh, older people obviously were not, were in the uh, older years of their own lives. And, uh, but, but the younger folks had lived through it or were, or died during the Holocaust. But this is my father, uh, my dad, again, says about 1920. He was probably a little older than 20. He, had, he was from a family of nine brothers and sisters. And uh, his father died at a young age. A couple, two of these, one sister went to, you know, went to Israel, got married and went to Israel. Uh, this Ellie is the one who was in Frankfurt that I'll tell you about in a little bit later. These two are the younger sisters who went to New York with their butcher husbands on virtually on their honeymoon. And Ola went to Argentina. So some of them lived through it. Ellie and then, see, I said Ola, one of these sisters. Yeah, this is... Uh, went to uh, Holland and she and her family were, were killed. And then this is his brother who died at a young age also. So my father, uh, because at, when his father died, 
and my mother and my grandmother was left with my, with all these children. They actually sent my father to Hanover, which was some miles away. And he initially was in an orphanage through his high school years. And then he went, uh, we would call it here, a teacher education and seminary and learned to be a Jewish school teacher and to be a, a teacher, but a, and basically became a Jewish scholar. My father was a very well versed in, in the, the Hebrew version of the Old Testament, which is, we say is the Torah. You could start my father anywhere in Hebrew, anywhere, and he could recite the next paragraph from memory. Um, so then when he finished, <clears throat> He, he was asked when we did an oral history years ago whether, why he didn't go on to become a rabbi. He said it would have taken three more years akin to a PhD here, and he didn't have, didn't, it was going to be too expensive. So his first assignment uh, literally was to go to my mother's hometown of Eder Oberstein and uh, started teaching religious school classes. And in his, in his religious school class, there was a 16 year old named Gerda Rosenberg. And uh, he started taking his meals at her parents. Her father also, Seishman, was a butcher. And he had a butcher shop and he had a slaughterhouse next door. And he, so he had a fairly large staff. It's not, it wasn't a huge slaughterhouse, but um, it was, I remember it, but in any event, they had a fairly large group for lunch and for dinner. And my dad started eating there and spending quite a bit of time with my mother. And we have a photograph of them um, in the class, but I don't have it here with me. So then my father, after he had been in Eder Oberstein for a couple of years, went, got a better position, applied for a position in Magdeburg uh, as a school teacher and working in, in the uh, Jewish welfare office uh, located in Magdeburg. And my mom and uh, he moved into a suburban uh, apartment complex which was just outside of Magdeburg. In fact, one of the few places that wasn't totally bombed out. And uh, we're living as a very nice young couple. And we're still out when, and during the time they were living out of, outside of Magdeburg, I was born in 1931. And then they decided, my father, I guess, decided that he wanted to be closer to his work. And they rented an apartment which was in the building next door to the synagogue. It was an L-shaped building with a large courtyard. I remember learning to ride my bicycle in that courtyard, but we lived upstairs <clears throat> and, um, and, they were and they lived a, in fact, this is, uh, so, so this is the cover of the Magdeburg phone book from 1938. Uh, Sometimes when I talk to kids, as, as you know, there are still people who are who are the den Holocaust deniers, and I always think looking at a phone book is a pretty good document. You can't read it, but it says up here, Rosenberg, Lehrer, teacher, uh, Schulstrasse, so I say, the name of the street was Schulstrasse, which is the street with the school and it has the telephone number. And uh, so they uh, were very happy uh, those early days. And I keep this uh, slide showing my mom on a walking me on the left and my brother, who was probably between about two, this was probably right before Kristallnacht, walking in the park. And uh, I think what I want to, have you remember is, and is that, that my, my parents, like many others at that time, were leading a very nice middle-class life. Now, during the 30s, things got worse and worse, obviously, for Jews. The Nazi party, Hitler, 
<clears throat> started imposing more and more anti-Jewish codes. The uh, prevented doctors and lawyers from practicing their profession. You've seen the signs, no Jews allowed in the store. Uh, things got worse and worse. Hitler was quite manipulative. He, it's interesting if you have a chance to look at the PBS series, Rise of the Nazis, it uh, does a really excellent job of detailing how Hitler rose to power. First, as you know, he, he tried to put once and he was in prison during which he wrote Mein Kampf. But then when he came out, he started as a fairly low level politician and worked his way up and through conniving and really some political smarts, he, he, made, he got himself to the top. And with these allies of his started getting, imposing these anti-Jewish codes and laws. My father, I think like many other, like a, a fair number of others, uh, was, didn't, was one of the later people to realize how bad things had gotten. Uh, in fact, uh, I would try to point out during World War I, many Jewish men fought for the Germans during World War I. And we, we have a picture, I don't have it here, I think it's with my brother of my grandfather on my mother's side with his German uniform and his helmet and his pointed point on top. And, uh, and so it was logical to believe that they thought they were Germans and their religion was being Jewish, much like we would say we're Americans and we're Jewish, whether we're bad, whatever our religion happens to be. Of course, this gets, we're talking really about genocide of Jews at this time. But every once in a while, I ask a class, well, what if you one day out of nowhere, uh, the government came down with an edict or the governor that today we're going to arrest all the Baptists in, uh, in this country and put them in a concentration camp. So it's quite unthinkable. But in any event, um, getting back, so this is mother, we're in the park. And I think uh, my parents were really quite protected because my own recollection before Kristallnacht is not filled with bad memories. Um, I know my parents had many friends, had a lot of parties, uh, they were young. I had friends I played with. And so I think this, uh, my dad finally in about 1937, which was pretty late in the game, went to Berlin and stood in line for a couple of days to get his papers and get to, to leave the country and to get permission. But then he came back to Magdeburg. I think he, at that point they were expecting to come. Now my, my grandfather on mom's side and, she, and her two sisters, uh, younger sisters, they came to the United States in 1936. And as I mentioned, the other two sisters were, um, had come over in the late 30s also. So my dad, so we were still there in Magdeburg in 1938, living in the building next to the next to uh, next to the synagogue. Uh, one other slide I think I'd like to show because I point out to the children in, that I speak to, they're not all kids, but whatever. The first day of school in Germany and probably in many European countries is a big deal uh, in a way as it is here, uh, but they make it really a big deal. And so you receive one of these long cones filled with goodies, and that's me on the first day of school. Um, actually, I think by that time in 1937, I think, so I would have started in 37. Hitler decreed that Jewish students would no longer be in school with non-Jewish kids and segregated the school systems. And my father and one other teacher started the school for Jewish children. Uh, and I was in his class 
uh, as long as it lasted. So that brings us up to Crystal Night in November 9th, 1938. Uh, we were all asleep in our room in our uh, apartment. It's a very nice, large apartment. And during the night, I think probably around midnight, they banged on the door and had us all come out, had the family come out into the courtyard and they proceeded to dynamite the synagogue. And they brought the prayer books out into the courtyard and made a big bonfire. And uh, I, we have a, actually I have a photograph. So this is what the synagogue looked like the next day and I, I remembered it quite well with, I think these pictures were my nephew teaches at the University of Oregon and uh, has been very interested in genealogy and has been to Magdeburg several times. And that the archivist had in Magdeburg had these photographs. We don't know who took them, but this is the interior and you can see how badly it was damaged. Most of the synagogues were burned down. And we were told the reason this one was not burned is because there was a hospital next door and they were afraid it would damage the hospital. So they dynamited this building. Um, this is the ark. It's up front, you see at the beginning, if you go to any of the synagogues, and as you know, in uh, the nearest one to you is in Lexington and there's a large congregation in Louisville. Um, let me go back a minute. This is other damage to the office buildings and I haven't figured out how to go back yet to where we were. But um, Diane, can you bring that back up again or do I? If you hit the back arrow, the left arrow on your uh, screen, oh, yeah, okay. it should go back. Or if you hit exit, you can hit exit again. There you go. Now, now I hit the back screen. Okay. So while this was going on, we were standing out there in the courtyard and my mother was holding my two-year-old brother and I was there and my dad, I was standing there. And I, we think his brother, my, his mom had been living with us. I don't recall her being there, but in any event, my mother, while we were there, my mother asked this Nazi goon with his rifle or whatever he was carrying whether they were going to kill us. And uh, his answer was he didn't know. And um, so I thought she didn't have any problem asking him. And so, it, but it's memorable. And according to her, uh, my only comments were alles kaput, alles kaput, everything is broken. Um, so the next morning after we, after they did all this damage, they'd been upstairs and they let us go back into our apartment. And um, it had been badly, they really ransacked it. It was really no longer livable. Uh, my recollection is that I remember they put a mattress on the kitchen floor, which was when you walked into the apartment, you walked right through into the kitchen. And the next morning, uh, there was a rap on the door and the Nazis came to arrest my father. And uh, so I usually say like a good Jewish mother, my mom asked him to wait so that he, they, she could make a sandwich for him. And uh, that he could take with him. But um, I didn't wait long, but she finished the sandwich and gave it to me and told me to run after him, which I did. And so they took my father to the jail along and they had also arrested 125 other men. And they were, they were all crammed into a couple of jail cells. They thought they would be there, they would come home at night they kept them there really for about two days and then they took them to the Buchenwald concentration camp. And, and they were in Buchenwald for 
uh, 16 pretty horrific days. I mean, my father, like many, didn't really like to talk about it very much. Um, but um, he, basically, he, he said he was determined to live through it. And some days, I think all they did was stand or stand. Uh, I can't imagine that at all. But, about, um, but then on the 17th, literally on the 17th day, I should mention my mom in the meantime, uh, she had sent me uh, to Frankfurt to my father's sister and we had a little boy my age. And then she brought my brother, Harry, to a family whose daughter had been a babysitter for him, and I guess maybe even for me, that used to live upstairs above us in the same building, and then had moved away. Mom stayed with different people every night, but she dropped my, my, uh, my, my brother there. And significantly, the, the, uh, the babysitter's brother was, had been, was sent to this country on a kinder lift. In the late 30s, many Jewish families went ahead and sent their children to this country and England and other countries expecting the worst, but were not able to get out the whole family. And you may read about these kinder lifts. Well, he sent the brother, and the brother later on grew up and joined the army and was with Patton. And then Went, uh, went to England and met his wife-to-be who was worked with the RAF and then brought her back to Detroit where he had lived and with a foster family. And they then had, they were married, they had three daughters. And if you believe it, two of the daughters turned out to be, are now in Kentucky. And we didn't know that till a couple of years ago when I got an email uh, from one of them saying, are you John Rosenberg, who's from Magdeburg? And uh, one of the daughters is a psychologist in Somerset, and the other one works at uh, Virginia. Cardinal Hill. And, and Cardinal Hill. Yeah, Cardinal Hill. So we've become very good friends in the last couple of years, and they've actually been back to Magdeburg. But back to my dad, uh, during this time, I want to uh, want to move this on a little bit. So my father, after those... 16 days. This is the document, and lessons shine. This is the document, Rudolf Rosenberg. He was in Buchenwald uh, from the 11th of November to the 27th. People always say, how come he, how is he able to get out? Well, this is before the final solution, before the Germans had decided they were going to eliminate all the Jews. And so it varied from one concentration camp to the other. But in my father's situation, 25 of those 125 people were, were, did not make it. Some ran into the fence, some went crazy, and some uh, were killed. But uh, luckily, he and the uh, close to 100 of the others were able were released. And he was given 30 days to get out of the country. And, and so because his sister, I think, had the one who was in Rotterdam, and he had that connection and had a passport, he took us to Rotterdam. We did not to live with the family, uh, but to live in a, to go to a detention camp. The Dutch government had set up detention camps in various places because so many Jews were coming from European countries and hoped to get out and were just there. And so one of, in our situation, the detention camp was the overnight hostelry for the Holland America line. So if you were gonna take a cruise ship from Rotterdam the next day, you'd spend the night in this place. If you had a nice cabin on the, uh, on the ship, you'd get a nice overnight, and we were probably in the middle. We had a, our family was in a little cubicle with two bunk beds on one side and two on the other uh, for my mom and for my father, and then for Harry and for me. And uh, 
And so there we were for about a year. My father started a school there. Um, I'm going to backtrack just for a minute about my father because it's relevant to our leading. My dad was well known in the community. And somewhere in a while, probably in the middle 30s, one of the Jewish agencies wanted to raise money in Magdeburg. And so they said, how do we, who do we go? Who knows the folks who are willing to make good donations? And they said, go see Rudy Rosenberg. He knows everybody. And this fellow from the Jewish agency went to see dad and they spent four or five days raising money together for the Jewish agencies. Now, fast forward again to our stay in the detention camp. My father started a school in the detention camp. He didn't have any materials, but he saw all these kids running around and he thought they needed something to do. So he literally started a school. He always was big on oral drills. He taught math by exercises. And, uh, but, and so when, what happened was that the authorities in Holland were, uh, thought he did such a good job of running a school in this detention center that they said, we'd like you to come to open the school in Westerborg. And Westerborg was the camp, the transition camp. It hadn't been, they were just in the process of building it. But after it was built, it became the transition center where the Germans, after they took over Holland and the other countries, would bring Jews from all over the country and the train would leave once a week on Tuesdays from Westerborg and go to Auschwitz where they would be murdered. And somehow my father had a premonition that when they made this offer, that if he ended up going to Westerborg, we weren't going to make it. <clears throat> And so he heard that there was a committee from the Jewish agency that was meeting, trying to set up the priorities for who was getting on the ship, the next ship, um, because there were too many people who wanted to get out and not enough space. And of course, in, in, the, Ameri in the United States, there was still an immigration quota. And as you know, it was still very difficult to get into this country. And, uh, for example, they, my two sisters, it was very hard to find anybody that was willing to sponsor you. My sister, his sisters in this country had no real, they just had their first jobs and they, you had to show that you could support somebody. So anyway, uh, when my father had this, when he heard about this, this group that was prioritizing who would get on the ship, he said he made it his business one day to go down and find the committee. And at the end of the day, he went and he saw the after the last person had been interviewed, he knocked on the door and they said, come in. When he opened the door, the fellow said, Rosenberg, what are you doing here? And it turned out to be the very person who had gone fundraising with him back when in Magdeburg. So he said, told him what he wanted to do was go to the United States. And he said he would see what he could do for him. Now, we'll never really know. What we do know is our ticket was paid for by HIAS. And if you know about HIAS, they do refugee work all over the world. Now that back then, I think they worked primarily with Jewish refugees. But I always tell folks if they have a little extra money after hearing the story, uh, give some, make a donation to Hyas, or make a donation to the Jewish Fund for the Righteous, which is supporting non-Jewish people who help to house or otherwise help Jews escape and took care of them during that terrible period. So, That's probably what he's doing. so at that point, um, we did get out on the next ship and uh, uh, made it to this country and landed when we landed in uh, New Jersey, uh, all the flags were flying and we thought this was a wonderful welcome for us. It turned out it was George Washington's birthday, now called President's Day. And we were met at the ship by my mother and uh, 
mother's my sister. mother's sister, my mother's sister, who gave me a quarter and said, it's a lot of money, take care of it. And uh, just quickly at that point, we lived, we moved in with her father and the two sisters in Washington Heights. My dad had difficulty finding a job. Nobody told him how to become a school teacher in this country. So he went to Spartanburg, South Carolina and Gastonia, North Carolina, became a sort of a, on weekends, a para rabbi. They didn't have a rabbi and help conduct services. And he was still, uh, he was still, and during the week, he was, he was sweeping floors as a janitor in a textile mill. Over time, he worked his way up. And uh, it was one of those great stories in Spartanburg. People were very welcoming, but if you can remember, if you can possibly imagine uh, moving from a culture where you were well accepted and knew no English and were suddenly plunked down in a segregated society in Spartanburg, South Carolina, and asked to understand the culture and what school kids did after school and whether you should send your children home to a party or what was the right thing to do. Uh, it's quite, it's a, you know, it's a big load. So I'm going I should probably stop there because I think we're at, yeah. I've gone 40 minutes and that's longer than I expected. So I could keep going from there, but I think probably a good point to stop. Let, oh, wait a minute, I should probably show you just, I think there are a couple more slides on here. This is a slide of Magdeburg, <clears throat> with, uh, which was badly bombed out. And interestingly, the cathedral was not, was left intact. And one year we were there, we took my, Jean and I took my mom back to Magdeburg and to her hometown. Um, and when we were here, we were told there was an exhibit to the Jewish congregation uh, in a nearby museum and we went to see it. And that's where I saw where was, there was a diary from the rabbi that I was able to read the beginning of, it was in German. And we later, through my nephew, uh, where it was able to see the rest of the diary uh, in German, it's been translated. There was actually a PhD thesis by a fellow who read in Australia who did oral histories of the Magdeburger Jews and a lot of that, of those interviews. And this is a memorial where the synagogue stood uh, in most cities, Lair included, there is just a memorial. There may be only a plaque on the wall of a store that shows where the synagogue was. And most, there are no real European Jews left in Magdeburg. However, a congregation of Eastern European Jews and Russian Jews has come back to Magdeburg. And I'm told from my nephew that they're building a new synagogue, which will be dedicated in 2023. And uh, I think that's the last. There's one more slide. Uh, this is a photograph. <laughs> My mother is from a very picturesque little town, Eder Oberstein, and they built a church into the mountain. Uh, this, uh, a lover, the story is a lover's leap. A fellow was unhappy because his girlfriend left him and he fell off the, he fell, he jumped off the top and where he landed is where they built the church. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now ask Ernie what he wants. Okay, questions? it's up to, I'll turn it over to Ernie and I'm glad to keep going or to have people ask questions. Is that okay? I think you're muted, Ernie. Ernie, your mic is off. Yeah. There we go. Um, John, that was terrific. Please put your questions now into the chat room. And while you were doing that, John, I've heard you talk before about coming into New York Harbor. Can you reflect on that? Well, I mean, I think uh, as a nine-year-old, the voyage itself was quite an adventure um, because when we left 
your people are looking for mines. And then during the journey, I was able to see the first colorized uh, film, which all of you know, I think produced in Hollywood, it was The Wizard of Oz. And you didn't have to know English very well to understand the plot, I think. But that was pretty much, but when we learned, I don't know that, um, I think for my parents, it was really, uh, you know, this is really my parents' story. And I'm sure landing there finally and having, uh, you know, my dad's sisters found a sponsor, uh, finally found a sponsor, a very distant relative who was an architect in New York. And, uh, uh, and my father find, always said he, find, he went to see him uh, afterwards and to uh, thank him. And basically the conversation was that my father thanked him and he said, you're welcome and go And that was the end of that. So we've known of some further relations afterwards, but anyway, that was, um, that was a great, you know, without a sponsor, you were really, you, you weren't gonna get over here. Uh, so I'm not really, a, a, but in terms of getting, we were not at Ellis Island uh, at that point. It was the boat, I think, landed in Hoboken. And, uh, you know, it was a new adjustment for me that during the six months that we were in New York, they sent me to, in New York, all the schools are PS, so public school, PS 132 on Wadsworth Avenue to a class where, which was filled with kids who didn't speak English. And uh, somehow they managed to, uh, I think I learned more probably on the sidewalks of New York playing stickball with kids, learned enough English to get by. And, uh, but on Thursdays we had to wear white, red, white, and blue for the auditorium and the war was on and it started. And um, so it was, that was an interesting experience. It was totally different to get to North Carolina. I don't really have much more recollection. I suppose the other thing that's worth mentioning is that my name in German is Hans and my brother's name is Horst. And when we came off the ship and people and we were walking through, he, as I understand it, you know, and I remember a little of this, he said, you're, not, you're Hans, you're now John. Horst, you're now Harry. And basically that was the way it happened. I know my mother always wondered why my dad, why didn't call me Henry, but in any event, uh, that's where the, I became John. And I do have a neighbor down the street who, who has a brother named Hans, who has a brother in Germany whose name is Hans. John, you have several questions. Uh, let, me, let me get to some of them. Um, okay. What, if any, was the hardest part? And this is from Terry Brothers Johnson. What, what was the hardest part for you as a nine-year-old adjusting to life in the United States? Um, I think uh, I think just understanding, getting to understand the language, and learning the way. Uh, going walking to school, we were pretty poor. Dad worked his way up, but I, the first present I ever received from them was a fountain pen, and the second was a bicycle because I knew I wanted to deliver newspapers, and uh, so I could make some money. And uh, and uh, yeah, so, well, I delivered first the Spartanburg Herald Journal, and then I delivered the paper in Gastonia for a while. But, um, and so I always worked after school and worked all the way through college. Um, but I, 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 you know, that's really what I remember. I think I had very caring elementary school teachers uh, when I came uh, in the early, those early grades, since I couldn't speak English very well, but I understood. And um, in fact, they had me going around to classes at some point and giving little talks about because I was the new little, new little classmate who's, who had been in Germany. Um, so I think, but kids adjust very quickly. And uh, 
I think much more difficult. I remember when we walked down the street with my parents, uh, we tug at their sleeves and said, don't speak German, don't speak German. Mm. Uh, so, and eventually they did stop speaking German even to each other, which I thought was quite remarkable. You have a question from Brent Irvin, uh, thanking you for your presentation. And he asks, how do you recall being treated by German non-Jewish people during the rise of the Nazi party and after they came to power? Is it comparable to the prejudices we see sometimes see in the United States now with right-wing nationalists? Do you see any similarities with current trends in the United States? I think there are very, very parallel, there are very certainly parallels to the right wing front to these violent, these groups that are, uh, you know, that are the right wing groups that did that, that uh, violence at the Capitol. And uh, they're like the Klan when we were in Mississippi, working in Mississippi. Uh, it's, it's racial hatred. And, uh, I think when I've been growing up, you know, after we, while the schools were segregated, as I said, I think my parents were pretty protective of us as we were growing up. But obviously, the thing things got really bad. And uh, anyone who's looked at this history, uh, and I'm sure you've seen uh, films and read some of that history that in Germany. I mean, the the Holocaust, the people who having done that both to Jews and to folks who were disabled and gypsies and this terrible period. And you always think it can't happen here. And hopefully it can't happen here. I mean, I was spent four years in the United States Air Force. And I told people my eyes really to the, the my my first most meaningful experience, I think, in the racial context is when I was in the Air Force and a friend of ours, a friend of mine who was on my crew, we were bringing a plane back from England to the United States. His name was Abe Jenkins and he was black. And we were, when we got to the Long Island uh, fact, Grumman factory, we dropped this plane off and then we, decided to go see our parents and he was from Charleston, South Carolina and we were in uniform and uh, we got on the train in New York and when we got to DC, he said, I'll see you when we get back to England. And I said, well, where are you going? And he said, I'm going to the back of the train where the blacks sit. And of course the Air Force had been desegregated and that it was powerful, uh, a powerful incident that I, I think I never forgot. Um, so I think we just have to be vigilant. I mean, I think these groups are ones that I think the current administration is much better. And uh, I, I just think it, you do have to be worried, but I think we have a better system in this country. The rule of law is still the most, is still our, the rule of law. It's not what Hitler decreed. There were, picked, there were judges who took an oath to follow Hitler's laws. We don't have that in this country. And uh, even though uh, you may not always agree even with the Supreme Court and, some of the, and wish some of the justices might have been different, but when push came to shove with this last election with uh, in which Trump tried how many times, 65 times, and how many times in the Supreme Court, they wouldn't hear of it. And so I think that's the kind of system that we have that we can be proud of. Um, so I think the parallels are certainly there, but we just have to be vigilant to make sure that, that uh, we don't have this sort of thing happen in this country that happened there. And I can combine a couple of questions. Uh, one is, um, uh, how did you meet your wife? And I know, and I know that you met where you met her. And then, could you talk about going to Mississippi and the work that you did there? 
Well, I met Jean in the Department of Justice uh, when we were both working in the Civil Rights Division. I joined the division in 1962 and uh, out of law school. <clears throat> and uh, Jean came in 65 after finishing at Earlham. Um, she was recruited by my boss, although at the time we didn't know it. His name was John Doerr. He was first assistant and later became assistant attorney general and was at a at a Earlham where Jean was in school and was giving a talk and her roommate had, uh, her roommate, Dorothy Landsberg, who became a lawyer had, was gonna introduce John because she worked for him for the summer and then she chickened out because she thought she would, they would tease her. And so she got Jean to introduce John. And so then he uh, recruited her to come to work for the division thinking, uh, suggesting she might want to, might like the establishment instead of just being this troublemaker, uh, <laughs> the, uh, Quaker troublemaker. But, um, but I, uh, and so Jean ended up uh, in my section and uh, we, you know, it was, and uh, we were, we then started at one point, we started work, we worked on this. I think John Doerr made sure that she, periodically she would end up uh, at a, in a location where I was trying a case or was working. And so we were, we, uh, we worked together uh, on several of those cases. And uh, um, one of those, uh, at one point, um, at one point she had gone, we'd worked together and she'd gone back to Philadelphia. And uh, there'd been a bombing of my former a classmate, Julius Chambers, who started the first integrated law firm in Charlotte. And um, they tried to bomb his house. They bombed it once before. He wasn't hurt, but we, uh, so John Doerr sent me there too. And Nick Flannery, who tried the Boston school case, became a judge in Boston to uh, take this, uh, this uh, incident to the grand jury. There had been some others in Charlotte and uh, while Nick and I uh, were at lunch one day, I said, Nick, well, I've been working with Jean uh, day and night. I think if I'm gonna call her up and ask her if, to, if she won't marry me. Too much information. <laughs> Too much information. And so I did. And so the next day she and her, her parents decided they'd come down to Gastonia to see who these Rosenbergs were. And the rest is history. But uh, the most significant later. case we worked on together, I think, was the first case under the Voting Rights Act. Um, after the Voting Rights Act, which eliminated literacy tests, the first big election was in Selma, Alabama, uh, in Dallas County, after the march that you all are familiar with, if you saw Selma. Uh, the first election <clears throat> under the Voting Rights Act, when large numbers of blacks were able to register was uh, in Selma in May, 1966. And there were, the paper ballots were very, they were still using paper ballots. They were very long. And uh, I think there were 70 different contested races. It was the first time that black election officials were had, were, had been officials. And in the predominantly black precincts, these black officials worked really hard to make sure their ballot counts went well and they took a long time. And finally, about eight or nine o'clock at night, the Dallas County Executive Committee, which was all white, decided they're taking so long, there must be fraud going on. We're gonna go pick up those boxes. And they went out and picked all the boxes up and brought them in. And the next day they said, well, the fair thing to do is just not to count those ballots. We'll just have the election count the other boxes. And uh, so then we filed a lawsuit to require them to count the boxes. And without those boxes, there was a Sheriff Jim Clark, who was this terrible sheriff that we could talk about for a while. He had filed for re-election. And, uh, and so we filed this case and we got a this, we required them to keep, they agreed to, to, we got an order impounding the ballots. And Jean Rosenberg and her former roommate, Dorothy Landsberg, were 
in charge of keeping track of those ballots and counting them. And it was in the Dallas County Courthouse and the Dallas County Deputy Sheriffs kept wanting to take them out to the cemetery and, uh, and to take them out. But they took, but they rebuffed their efforts even though they gave them these buttons that said never, uh, which referred to desegregation. If you remember the Wallace era where they had these never buttons. So the result of this case was that Judge Thomas, who was from Mobile, who'd been very slow in desegregating the Mobile schools, Judge Thomas ordered the ballots to be counted. And the result of that was that Jim Clark was defeated, a more moderate person, a more moderate candidate became the sheriff. And, uh, but it was a case that uh, Jean and I, uh, that she did a lot of the work in, and Dorothy, and, and was able to evade the advances of these deputy sheriffs. <laughs> it was a significant case. There's two questions I'm going to combine together. Uh, one, one is, um, what happened to your dad? Did he ever become a teacher? And how did your mom and dad explain racial segregation in the United States to you? Well, <clears throat> um, my father never became a teacher. He worked his way up in the mill business after being a janitor. He eventually, uh, we moved from Spartanburg to Gastonia. There was a, there was a family, a fellow named Heilburn who was Jewish, who was from Magdeburg. I didn't know that history at the time, who had a textile factory in Germany that he had moved to North Carolina to the little town called Lowell, about six miles from Gastonia, maybe a little more. And so he got my father to come work there and made him an office manager. So basically a white collar job if for in this textile factory. And dad, he was, my father was very active in the Jewish community. He still conducted services from time to time. And, uh, uh, but we were, but he was, we were a working family and most of the Jewish uh, families there were second generation. Their fathers and grandfathers had been uh, peddlers and come and come to the Southern community. If any of you have read a book called The Jew Store, it tells kind of a paperback, it tells the story of a family from New York that moved to Tennessee, I think, Partly, it's sort of a combined fiction, nonfiction story. Anyway, my dad uh, did not become a teacher, but uh, continued to read a lot, very bright, spent a lot of time in the community. And then, uh, and mother, uh, my sister, who was on this thing, was born uh, in 1946. <clears throat> I graduated from high school in 49. So she only saw a little of us, my little more of my brother. But uh, the question about how did they explain segregation? <clears throat> Excuse me. I think what happens, at least then, you take the society that you are sent to. And my parents were so grateful to be in this country that it wouldn't have mattered where we were. I tell us that if that was the system in Gastonia, North Carolina, that's the system they were going to live in. And in truth, and the Jewish, you know, in rec I think all of us, when we think back, <clears throat> wonder why the Jewish community, most of whom were store owners, weren't they more aggressive about trying to move segregate to move towards integration and to criticize segregation. But they themselves at that point couldn't get into the country club. They were well off, but they couldn't get into the country club. And um, so I, I think, as I said, this incident with Abe Jenkins had more of an impact on me. So I don't think, I think my parents accepted the system as it was. Um, 
I would say, I tell people when we, when my parents were naturalized the, uh, in 1945, they studied hard for those naturalization exams. <clears throat> we went to Charlotte, North Carolina to the ceremony and they became American citizens. And after that event, we went across the street to the Piedmont Diner to have lunch. And that was the first time in this country that we had ever been out to eat as a family. Because we didn't have any money because they were poor. And that day it was so significant for them. So long way to say back then, if, that, if segregation was the way that uh, the system worked in Charlotte and Gastonia, um, they accepted it. And I think, and I think I accepted it. And went to, at the time I went to Duke University on a tuition scholarship, Duke was still a white school. Uh, but law school, I was in the, after I came out of the Air Force and went to law school, um, one of my good friends, I think I mentioned was Julius Chambers, who was number one in our class, who was black. We had five black uh, classmates in law school. And it wasn't an easy time, easy school. That was a statewide, a very good law school, but the attitudes certainly of the students was still very conservative at best. And there were very few of us who were, became friends. Julius and I became friends for many years and later years, uh, he was also the general counsel in ACP League of Defense Fund that he, started the poverty, the civil rights center at the University of North Carolina School of Law. He died a few years ago, a couple of years ago, and the center is now named in his honor. He was a remarkable man. John, you have some someone uh, from the Facebook stream who said, what advice do you have to those of us listening who want to follow in your footsteps and continue to do social justice work? And they also want to know if you plan to write a book. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, I, I appreciate the compliment. Um, you know, to me, it's uh, you live the great American dream. I couldn't have had a career that's more fulfilling and uh, where, where we are uh, paid to do some of that. But in more recent years, I haven't been paid, but I just feel very fortunate to be able to help people. I think that uh, you just, uh, you do the best you can. And there is, as you know, an enormous gap in this country between people who are poor and people who have wealth. And we do have this awful history of race in our country. Uh, we do have, we have started a community remembrance project. I know some of you who are in Frankfurt have, uh, have done that, I think with the Methodist church there. And we know that there are some, there have been some lynchings in Eastern Kentucky, uh, which we want to look into and, and, and confront that history in this area so that we can be looking towards a better future. Um, and I think uh, the opportunities are certainly there. I mean, there's so many you know, wonderful ways to spend your life, whether it's as a school teacher or as a social worker or in the law. Ernie's had a wonderful career himself. Most of the lawyers, I'm proud to say, have been with Apple Red and worked with me. Most of them have stayed in public interest work, whether as a public defender or in civil legal services. Very proud of what they're doing. But it, uh, um, I don't think it's, uh, I think you, you just uh, have to be aware. I know that College educations are very expensive now, but now we there's still the loan forgiveness program for people who have worked 10 years and, uh, in a social services uh, setting, even though Betsy DeVos did a lousy job, I think now under this new administration, people will find that those loans are gonna be forgiven. Um, so I don't know that that's a very articulate way of answering the question, I think you just, there's plenty to be done in Appalachia. There's a plenty to be done in no matter where you are. Um, that, uh, Jean, you have any advice? No. 
Um, wow, that's enough. <laughs> Uh, last last question, and then you have uh, and someone just made a statement, and uh, uh, this is also from Facebook. They want to know your thoughts on refugees, uh, how you would prioritize where to take refugees, and if you see urgency there. And I know, given your experience with um, uh, uh, the limitations on accepting Jewish re refugees prior to and during the war, uh, they want to know what you would do about that now. Oh, it's a hard one. Well, obviously this country opened its doors to us and it did not open its doors to many others. Um, even though, um, and so, you know, I think we have to be a welcoming society. I think most of the uh, kids, I mean, it's just, anguishing to watch these children walk these miles. And, uh, but we're, we're a big country. Many of them have relatives in this country. And I think, <clears throat> I think the children probably are the most important. And uh, I think we have to help these countries where all this, where these problems emanate so that people can uh, live where they wanna live without worries about gangs. I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. I don't think, um, I mean, if you have to, if you're leaving a situation where politically where you can't live a productive life, you're gonna have to, you leave. And uh, I think this is a much more humane administration. And I think we have a lot of room and uh, there are a lot of welcoming families there are a lot of welcoming groups that are working with refugees. And uh, so I think it's very, very difficult. I mean, I know that everybody watching probably has to empathize with the problems around the world. I mean, whether it's Sudan, whether it's the, the, those hundreds and thousands of people off the coast of Malaysia that, where they had the fires I mean, so many places where folks are living in Yemen. I mean, what, where can we, you just, in the end, you just have to do the, I think, help as many folks as we can. And there are no, not always any magic solutions to any of these things. I think donating funds and helping, I mean, we had a terrible flood here in eastern Kentucky recently just coming on top of the ice storms that we've had and families have lost all their homes and all their belongings and some have just built back and then lost it all again and so you know you want to try to help those folks that are close to you as much as you can um, and you even though these other problems persist out there and I, I don't think I have any more of a solution than anybody else. I just think we have to be welcoming as much as we can, let folks in, help them when they're here, and work on the problems in these other countries and uh, so that they can go home and want to stay there. These people don't want to live. They wouldn't be coming here. They wouldn't be walking 2,000 miles. If they, you know, I don't see how they, it's, it's beyond me. But. Uh, but I'm not telling you anything that you don't know, but it's, uh, I certainly appreciate being with all of you. I wish I were a little more articulate, and I'm sorry that I hope some of these long answers don't bore you to tears, but uh, I'm glad to stay as long as you want to stay. I want to, want to make sure and read uh, Karen Armstrong Cummings, um, who's with Together Frankfurt. I don't know if you saw her comment. But she said, just a note of respect and appreciation. Many thanks to John and Jean for sharing their evening with us. And John, your story is so profound that it's hard to articulate a question. When in college, I focused on that period of history and did a study abroad in Poland, the former USSR in East Germany. We toured Auschwitz-Birkenau. No one could speak. A bunch of college students from Western North Carolina when we got back on the tour bus, we didn't speak for the entire trip back to Warsaw. I so much treasure hearing your story. Blessings to you both, and thanks to the library. So um, 
Wow. And, and everybody is still on who started with us. So we thank you both. <laughs> you didn't lose anybody at eight o'clock. John, John, before we uh, wrap up, could you tell us again the names of those organizations you suggested for people who would like to learn more or get more involved? I believe um, uh, one of them was the Jewish Fund for the Righteous. Uh, what were some of those organizations? The other one, the group that paid for the ticket is HIAS, H-I-A-S. Forgotten what you did. I mean, if you Google highest, you uh, you'll find them. Uh, and they do extraordinary work with refugees around the world. Um, I would like to. Yeah, I guess I would just add that you know it's a personal <clears throat> story, but it doesn't account for how many others. Uh, I mean, there are the the stories of the survivors. If you have an opportunity to visit the Holocaust Museum in Washington, I'd urge you to do that. I think the one in Cincinnati is worth doing. I should mention the family in Frankfurt where I stayed, they were killed, they were murdered. The family in Rotterdam where four, there were four children, dad's sister married a businessman, my mom used to babysit, they were all killed. The uh, her, the grandmother, my grandmother lived to 19, well, dad's brother was killed and he, uh, he was actually married in the concentration camp and we met his widow in Israel some years later and she had remarried a wonderful woman. And uh, so let's see, I've, and his mother, so his mother lived in a little town called Meppel uh, that we visited a few years ago. And she was there till 1944, but they had, a, and then one day they came and picked her up the way they eventually got around to all the Jews that were in Holland. And uh, her name is on a plaque in that little town along with the other Jews who had lived there. And she was quoted to have said that she had to go back and, and get her prayer book. Uh, she was very religious. so. I think there were about 14, we counted 12 to 14 members of the family that were murdered. And we're just one little example of the, you know, horror of this experience. So I appreciate it. And uh, you can find programs in the, there are programs, ongoing programs on the Holocaust Humanity Center and the one in DC. So if you ask me a question, <laughs> you get a long answer. John, thank you and Jean so much for, for being with us. Thanks, Ernie. So good to see you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Good night. Thank everybody. you so much on behalf of the library. Um, uh, thank you to everyone who joined us. Uh, but thank you especially to John and Jean for joining us tonight, uh, for taking time to share your story. Um, with our community, both near and far. That's the benefit of, of this virtual um, sort of environment that we're in right now. Uh, but we appreciate you so much and, and all that you've shared with us. And um, thank you very, very much to Together Frankfurt. It, uh, the library appreciates you all and the work that you do in our community. And uh, we love working with you and we, we thank you for reaching out to us and including us in this really special event. Um, a reminder to those who are watching tonight, um, if you have friends who weren't able to join us um, and you would like for them to watch the recording of tonight's presentation, it will be archived on the Paul Sawyer Public Library uh, Facebook page. So please point them to the face to our Facebook page, um, and they can uh, watch watch tonight's presentation if they weren't able to join us live. Uh, but thank you again uh, to John and Jean, and thank you all for being here. And we hope to see you um, in the library or, or on another virtual program in the very near future. Thank you all. All right, thank you so much. Lovely to see you. Good night, everybody.